Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started. I want to thank you all so much for coming out today. You know we love having presenters and speakers come in, but when we can have somebody that's local, um, it's always a great day. So we're excited about our presenter today. I'm not going to introduce him. You know, I don't want to steal Dr. Ted's thunder ever. So, But I do want to let you know, again, these programs would not be possible if we didn't have the support of First Bank of Alabama. And so I always just want to make sure that we thank them. And we got Mr. Chris in the back. Would not be a program without Mr. Chris. 
And then I also want to welcome another member from the first Alabama team back there. We've got Mr. Ernest Jordan, and he is with another arm of the bank, and he is going to be around when the program is over. If you would like to stop and say hello to him and meet him, because I think it's always nice to know the people that are help making these things possible. So again, today, also Coosa Valley uh, Medical Baptist, Baptist Coosa Valley Medical Center, y'all forgive me, with our cookies. It would not be the same if Hickory Street Cafe did not do our cookies for us. So thank them. Dr. Shirley Spears with the Comer Library Foundation. She is not here today, but she sends her love to everybody. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Ted because he is the best introducer ever. I may be the best, but you're the most energetic. I've never seen anybody that much alive. No, no more coffee for you. It's a pleasure to welcome you all here, but I have been waiting with a great deal of anticipation for Chris to be here today. And I'll tell you what, uh, based on my experience with him when he was a chief here, when he was a policeman here, but you, you look at this, and we hear about all the problems of... Uh, defund the police and the thin blue line and what have you. And Chris is the exception just about anything that you see. He is the best that we can possibly see in our society. And he was a hometown boy. Uh, he got interested in uh, police work in the military. Uh, he graduated from Jacksonville State uh, Police Academy. Uh, he had extensive service here in Sylacauga for years. But then, you know, it was a part of the family. He, his grandfather, his father, his uncles, his friends, and his wife. Oh, Amy, I don't know that you were ever in it. Where is Amy? Stand up so they can see that he does have a wife. <laughs> it's nice to have you with him. So what I told the group here is that I hope that you have a good video of this because when you study what good police work is like, you'll come back to this film and to this presentation that Chris is going to make. And it's just one of those interesting things. When we look, uh, we were talking earlier where it's hard to find good people to do work, uh, find good policemen, find policemen who are dedicated, who put the public first and themselves second and the society in which they live, they put it in the top tier. But with the experience he had here in the Talladega Sheriff's Office, the Attorney General's Office, he's a friend of all. And Chris, we're just delighted to have you back. And so if you'll come on and uh, if you, you don't have to be armed with this audience. We checked them as they came in the door. So... Chris Carden. You are? I, uh, I don't need this. Do I need to cut this off? No, just set it down. All right. Well, I do have a little concern uh, about uh, the question as to whether or not I had a wife, uh, Dr. Spears. Uh, so uh, my lovely wife, Amy, is here. Uh, my father, Butch Carden, raise your hand. My daughter, Elizabeth, my daughter, Taylor, they're a little bashful. Uh, I have some other family members here. My wonderful Aunt Patty, so she's here. So, uh, yeah, yeah, round of applause for Aunt Patty. How about that? <laughs> so, uh, my name, um, okay, technical difficulty. Oh, okay. So uh, this is a picture of me that my mother took in uh, 1974. This is in Westland, Michigan. And my dad had to call the police because there was an 18-wheeler blocking our driveway. And this patrolman came in. He was wearing a uh, leather coat, leather Bailey's cap, and he had on a uh, Sam Brown belt that had a small stainless steel Rayovac two-cell flashlight. And this was in the winter, so... He, uh, he saw that I had taken an interest in him and handed me that flashlight. And you know how you can equate a memory to a feeling or to an emotion? I can still feel that cold, stinging flashlight in my hands. 
and looking at that man and looking at how cool he was. So I, as soon as he left, I ran. Of course, that's a boat captain's hat, uh, and that's like a deputy fire badge and a set of uh, black uh, or, uh, plastic handcuffs. But clearly, I was ready for the academy. So uh, I'm one of those that, you know, grew up doing uh, what he loved to do, never really worked. You know, I never really dreaded going to work. After, uh, well, when I got, when I became a teenager, I would go down to the PD and I'd sit there with my dad. Dad ran 911 for the city of Silicaga for 20 years. And I would go down there and I'd get to meet the police officers. And occasionally they would, uh, you know, if there was a cop in there and they had a little, you know, prowler call or an alarm call or something, they'd let me ride with them. So I'd jump in the car, you know, really not supposed to do that, but uh, I would do it from time to time. Interesting about this picture is you see those little uh, red boxes with the, uh, above the coffee pot? Those used to be connected to Cleveland's Jewelers and to, uh, what well, some other ones, Dad? Uh, the pollen shops. So in, in small police departments, what used to happen is your local business owners, uh, the heart of the community, would plug their alarm systems directly to the police department. No third party, you know, uh, so I always thought that was cool. And those were there until, gosh, I guess probably mid-2000s when they redid the radio room. This is Ernest Hubert Carden. This is my grandfather. And um, the story that I was told early in my career is that they wore denim shirts, dress shirts, because Avondale provided them to the city. So the street department, fire department, the police department, they all wore the same shirt. There were no uniform patches in those days. The only, the only thing that separated them was, of course, the badge. Uh, but you also notice the black bow tie. It's notoriously known that the Cardin family is very classy. So. <laughs> Here's a picture of some of the uh, police officers that back in the day I would have jumped in the car with. And you can probably see some people you recognize. Uh, Far left there, we have Steve Vickers. I see uh, Keith Wilson. I see Lewis Zook right here. I see Tommy Wallace right there. Kenneth Brasher right there. So this would have been about 1982. And here the police department is in 1985. This is one of those, hey, listen, if you'll let us take your picture, we'll go to every business in Sylacauga. They'll give us $100.00. We'll make $10,000, and we'll give you a picture. So that's what this is. And uh, I have some of my cards up at the table uh, right in front of Miss Clifton and the cookies there. I figured the cookies were probably the biggest draw. So if you want copies of pictures or whatever, I'll give you anything you want. Just email me. This is a patrol car that um, really kind of changed my life. This is uh, an 88... Ford Crown Vic, and it was driven by Trooper Robert Watson. Does anybody know Robert Watson in this room? Okay. Robert Watson was a Sylacauga police officer first. He left in 1986, went to Selma, went to the Trooper Academy, and wound up coming back to Taldega County. So this is where I really fell in love with it. I mean, when I was 14, 15 years old, I had been in car chases, and I mean, some, some things I just can't tell you about because I was just too young to really be doing that stuff. I may or may not have driven the state trooper car a time or two. <laughs> That's Robert. And this is on the, the day of my official swearing in as police chief in Silicon. And what's funny about this is I look exactly the same. <laughs> you know? Just have glasses, right? Yeah, just glasses. So uh, after high school, um, Army, military police, Fort McClellan. I uh, couldn't wait to carry a badge, so that was my first badge. And then uh, my first duty station was in Germany, came back, and I worked at Fort McClellan for a short period of time. Worked in a Tri-County Drug Test Force up in Calhoun and Etowah. Uh First day, Sylacauga Police Department. I went to every uh, agency in this county, and the only one that would give me a, a fair shot was, was Bill Hay in Sylacauga. And this was during the time, you, can, uh, you may not can tell it in this picture, but on my first ID card, I'm wearing a blazer. 
it was a rule then, when you came to the police department for your first day, you had to be in a suit. So I had to go buy a suit, but pretty interesting. So that's a little bit about me. I don't know if we're having technical difficulties here, but I keep hitting the button and nothing's happening. So there we go. Well, there's Bill Hay. These are the chiefs that I worked for. Bill Hay is the one that hired me in 1993, 94, and uh, sent me to the police academy and really, I mean, gave me my start. Uh, the second chief I worked for, uh, a lot of people may not remember this, but when Bill first left to go to retire with the private sector, this was Lieutenant Alvin Kidd. He was the first black assistant police chief in the city's history, and he was the first black police chief in the city's history. Jesse Cleveland brought Alvin back when Bill Hay left, and he served as the interim police chief until they appointed Louis Zook as the next police chief. So in the eyes of uh, APOS, which is the state body that governs law enforcement, police chief's a police chief. Interim doesn't matter. So Alvin Kidd was actually the very first black police chief in this city. Uh, the chief that I spent the most time with and mentored under and still love and respect and talk to as often as I can is Louis Zook. Louis left Sylacauga in uh, 2011. That's when I became the police chief. And he went to Montgomery and became the statewide law enforcement coordinator for the attorney general. So he represented the attorney general to every single law enforcement officer in the state. A couple of my mentors also that were not chiefs, but should have been or could have been very easily. On the left there is Lieutenant Wayne Merchinson. Uh, Wayne uh, knows more about murder, robbery, and assault than anybody I've ever talked to. On the right is Kenneth Brasher and Jimmy Nail. Now, uh, Kenneth Brasher is in the white, and he's doing what he always did, which was aggravating the fire out of anybody that was around him. So, uh, now this picture right here, this will dial you back a little bit. We're looking at a young Marty Batson, soaking wet. He weighed about 100 pounds, uh, but he was ferocious. Uh, Marty... In my opinion, Marty embodies Sylacauga Police Department. He really does. He represents so many different generations. Uh, such a sweet man, real passive, wouldn't hurt a flea, uh, just, a, just a great guy. So I miss him. Uh, we're going to talk now about the first police officer in the city of Sylacauga's history that was ever killed in the line of duty. And it's a sad, sad story. Um, it's, it's more than just his death that's a tragedy. Uh, but this happened in May of 24, or 1914. So um, this is Chief Sanford Perryman. Sanford Smith Perryman, he was born down in Fayetteville around 1876. Uh, he was named after his maternal grandfather, Sanford Vandiver Smith. Uh, not only the first police officer to be killed in the line of duty and the first police chief to be killed in the line of duty, but as far as I know or as far as I've been able to find, the very first police officer in the Sylacauga Police Department to ever go to college. And not only did he go to college, but he played football at the University of Arkansas. So he's a pretty good-looking guy, but, he, you know, he, he seems very small statured. And I don't know what it is about those days, but pictures are different. It's almost like uh, the photographer, right before they pulled the flash, he said, nobody smile. And then, you know, like those old Civil War photos. You know, we got to retake it because Wilson smiled, you know. So anyways, I digress. So uh, in 1900, he was living with his Aunt Frances Drusilla Smith in Texas. And uh, Community began as a stop on the San Antonio and Arkansas Pass Railway in 1890. We, we were able to, I say we, a member of his family was able to get some information. But I'm going to read a little bit of this letter to you. This is from the uh, Gro um, Groveton School System. And uh, it talks about uh, Chief Perryman and some action that he took one night when they had a fire. The scene that night... Uh, the Opera House, 
filled with people, caught fire behind the scene, and panic threatened. Mr. Perryman sprang on stage, ordered people to keep their seats, and put out the fire with his own hands. That was the Sulukaga police chief. Uh, There's a separate story that uh, he, uh, a wagon, a horse got spooked in a wagon with passengers, barreled down the middle of town. Sanford Perryman leapt up on the horse, got the reins, stopped the horse, saved the lives of the children, you know? You know, one time I changed the tire for an, uh, you know, a lady at Food World. Uh, there was never a letter written for that, you know? I really got the shaft. Uh, downtown Silicaga in 1934, of course, well after all this happened, uh, he, in 1910, he came back to Sylacauga, uh, probably to take care of family, and he married Claudia Coker in 1912. This is the Perryman clan. And again, right before the picture was snapped, instead of cheese, they said, you're fat. And then everybody, they snapped the picture. I mean, family portraits look very much the same today. I think. So here's the story. Um, Now, I do take a little liberty with, you know, third and fourth hand stories, so I'm just going to make it entertaining for you. Uh, Chief Perryman had gotten some intelligence from someone in town, probably a competing uh, bookmaker, uh, gambler, that Buster Sorrell was coming in on the train with whiskey. So uh, being the diligent police chief that he was, he went down to the train station and he confronted Buster Sorrell who got off the train car with us with a suitcase. There was a conflict, obviously, uh, and both men fired simultaneously. Buster Sorrell was the son of Dr. W.M. Sorrell, who was you know, he was the Dr. Camp of 1915, uh, okay? He was a big shot. Um, Sorrell Road over on near the quarry, that Sorrell Road is named after that family. So, um, so they wrap him up in, in cloths and they put, the, put the, the two bodies on the train with the police officer and they say, don't stop till you get to Birmingham. Well, there was some confusion as to really when and where they died. So... Uh, Sanford Perryman actually has two death certificates. He has one in Jefferson County and one in Shelby County. But needless to say, he died as a result of the gunfight as well as uh, Buster. Not long after that, uh, Claudia died uh, of tuberculosis. I, I kind of say, you know, I think, just to add some drama to it, she, she probably died of a broken heart. You know, she, she was a newlywed. Her husband was this hero. Uh, she probably became susceptible to tuberculosis just because she was just, just so sad. <laughs> tragic, tragic story. Sanford, is bur- uh, Sanford Perryman is buried in Marble City. Um, and I don't know who was responsible for getting all of this cleaned up, but it, it used to look terrible. And I think there was a, you know, a restoration project that happened. And they got in there and they cleaned it up really nice. So that's his marker. If you go, if you're going down Fourth Street, if you're uh, heading west, it's the first entrance. It's the, about the sixth or seventh plot on the left. Uh, it's worth it's worth your while to go by there and pay your respects. Um, there's his uh, marker, and there's also some um, some. It's interesting. There's some questions as to the date of death. It's interesting how records were kept then. Because uh, one death, death certificate says the first, the other one says the second. So, you know, that would never fly today. You'd have to go to, you know, 49 hearings to get, you know, get that straightened out. Uh, so, so, yeah, Sanford Perryman. And this is Buster Sorrell's grave. It's just down the aisle from Sanford's grave. They had the funerals on the same day right after each other. The Sorrell family was so disgraced and so upset that they, uh, they didn't bury anybody else there. 
So that's how it sits today. He ran a pool hall. You remember where, uh, I think it's Tubbs Pools now. It used to be Billy Bean's Bike Shop. The warehouse section behind that, uh, Buster Sorrell ran a pool hall, and that's where he was taking the whiskey. So um, there's a little bit of information about, you know, putting the parents on the gravestones. So I want that on mine. Son of Mackie Moore, baby boy, Butch Carden. I want it on my headstone. Um, so uh, for those of you that don't know, there's a National Police Officers Fall Memorial. It's in Washington, D.C. I've been, I've been several times. It's a beautiful place. And we have two officers on that wall. Sanford Perryman was the first. And um, there are still some long-lost family members of this man that are still in Sulacaga. And we're trying desperately to identify this photograph. Uh, we know the one on the right is possibly a, a male suspect, um, you know, between the ages of 50 and 80, somewhere in there. Uh, so Lee and Janet Perryman and their great, great, great uncle who was killed. Round of applause for the Perryman family. This one is, uh, is a little bit easier to talk about, not because of the death, but because of the information that's available. So Rex Sanford uh, was a wonderful young man and husband, and he was going to school at Auburn. He was working part-time uh, the summer that this happened. He, he died in September, but the summer leading up to the, the killing, he was driving back and forth to Auburn. I don't know why he didn't just go online and get his degree. And that's what I did. It was easy. Password, blah, boom. I don't know. Maybe Silicon Utilities didn't have their fiber up. So uh, anyways, that's Rex on the right. My favorite picture of Rex. I think Rex was probably pretty popular with the ladies, if you know what I mean. He's a stunning, handsome young man. Uh, World War II vet, you know, uh, Served his country, served his city, uh, you know, by all accounts, did everything right. This is the crime scene. Uh, anybody know where this is? I hear forks, so we're right about that. Of course, you do have some inside information. Uh, this is the forks. So this is where uh, we're going south on 21. We're about to go under the viaduct for 280. We're headed, to, we're headed to Rockford, okay? This is where the Forks Crystal is, what I would call the Forks Crystal, where Linda Offord was murdered in 1987. All right, this camper you'll see back here, this, uh, the camper is on the left, the truck pulling it's on the right. The family, there was a family asleep in that camper when the shooting happened, and that camper got lit up with bullets. The car that you can see closest to you is the police car. The car in front is a car driven by uh, Joe Pate, and he had a passenger by the last name of Caldwell. There's what it looks like today. All right, you can kind of see over here where that camper would have been, okay, under the, under the billboard. There's another angle, a little bit wider view. You can kind of see what's important in this picture is the closeness and the angle of the suspect vehicle to the patrol vehicle. Now today, in modern times, you would never park a police car like that because what's gonna happen when your passenger gets out, he's exposed, you know, so. But this is before going to police academies and all that kind of stuff. Now, this is another picture of the scene. The man with his hand on his hip is Alvin Rylant. Alvin Rylant is a family member of my grandfather. I don't know how, but he is. And uh, Alvin Rylant was responsible for getting my grandfather on at the police department. The guy uh, with his pants pulled up to his chin, uh, which was the fashion fad of the day, that is Captain Neil Denny. Neil Denny was the passenger in the police car that night that Rex was killed. Another view of the Sylacauga Patrol Unit. Notice no door markings, uh, just a siren on top. 
I always thought that was interesting. And it's a two-door. You know, you didn't have to really take people to jail back then. You know? My grandfather, Hubert, told me one time, in the old city hall that's, you know, used to be Tom Ogletree's house, and it's right across from the fire department, he said there was a set of iron steps in the back. It was not ADA compliant. And these iron steps went up to the top floor, which was the jail. And uh, my grandfather told me that there was many a case, uh, he did not use the word adjudicated, but he said there was many a case solved right back there on those iron steps. So you can imagine in the 30s and 40s, uh, justice was handled a little differently in those days. Policemen were a lot more respected as well. Now this shooting happened um, after law enforcement contacted Peyton Caldwell two times. The shooting happened on the second contact. First contact, this is where Pate and Caldwell were parked. Um, Denny and Rex pulled up and told them they had to leave. When they pulled in the parking lot, uh, Caldwell, no, Pate, tossed a weapon over the hood of the car towards the passenger side. Police pulled up. They have some back and forth. There's some, you know, yang yang going on. But... They're told to leave. Pate lived in uh, Parkdale, down in Goodwater. So they, uh, they shot out of the dirt parking lot, and they went to Goodwater, and they started drinking. Um, when they pulled off, Neil Denny found the pistol right on the other side of those railroad, I mean, those uh, telephone poles that are in the ground. So he picked it up. Evidence was handled a lot differently in those days. <laughs> you know, if... If you found a gun or if you found money, you know, you didn't know whose it was, so, so Neil threw it in the glove box. So they leave. They come, uh, uh, Pate and Caldwell go to Parkdale. You know, they're having a cocktail. Uh, and Pate, also a World War II veteran, uh, grabs a 1911 45 Colt and says, we're going to get our gun. So they drive back to Sylacauga, and they park where I showed you the first time by the camper. And Neil and uh, uh, Rex pull up, and when they do, there's a confrontation. It's basically, hey, where's my gun? And Rex uh, told Neil to kind of hang back. Neil was brand new. He had not been to the police academy. I mean, by modern uh, standards, Neil Denny should have not been on scene for this incident, okay? He's not trained. He, he, he should have not been there. Um, but he was, and he had to respond. So they told Pate, they said, look, you got to come down to the station, sign some paperwork, we'll give you the, your gun back. You know, they're not going to tell the guy, well, your gun's in the glove box, you know? So uh, heated, heated, Pate's under the influence, Rex is there. And boom. Who shot first? I mean, there's only two people that know. Uh, but uh, Pate was convicted for killing Rex. So Rex hits the ground. Of course, this untrained rookie policeman who'd never probably shot a gun, uh, he probably shot a rifle at a squirrel, all of a sudden is in a gunfight. He sees the car take off. He doesn't know to go to Rex and to apply a tourniquet and to pour in quick clot and to, you know, do first aid. He doesn't know. He's scared to death, you know? I would have probably, you know, created all three forms of matter right there on the side of the road. I wouldn't have, you know, it would be terrifying. Think about that. So Neil sees the bad guys leave, so he jumps in the patrol car and he chases them. And, uh, and that action, that, the action that he thought he was taking that probably all of us would have taken, stayed with him his whole life. And he was a sweet guy, and he, he was a good friend of mine, and his son is with us in the back. Uh, so thank you for your family service to the city. In World War II, uh, you know, when those, when those boys came back, uh, there was no PTSD. You know, think about your relatives that came back from World War II. They came back, they were cops, they were firemen, they worked for the city, or they drove a cab. Uh, these guys had no mental health treatment whatsoever. And, and Pate was, he was a veteran, and he had some issues. 
another thing that uh, is terrible is you'll see this is a picture again of Alvin and Neil Denny. They're trying to, they're standing, recreating the crime scene. Okay, this is the morning after Rex was murdered. Okay, so you've got the person that was involved in the gunfight back at the crime scene, less than 12 hours later, reenacting. Do you think any of that is accurate? He doesn't know whether he's coming or going. There's a picture of the troll car. So uh, Pate was convicted. Um, you know, there was, there was some argument. There was some, uh, again, who fired what, when, where, why, and why were y'all there? There's been, I mean, speculation and speculation all these years. What I can tell you is a police officer was killed in the line of duty. His name was Rex Sanford. He was an outstanding young man. His wife uh, was just haunted by this. By the way, her daughter is here with us. Um, let's give her a round of applause. They, had, they, they were newlyweds. They had not been married long. Do you remember on um, Odina Road where all the refrigerators used to be, that intersection? That's, that's how I name it. You know what I'm talking about? And across the road there is a uh, warehouse now that's for heritage. That was uh, Rex Sanford's place, okay? And what he would do, and I have this on on first-hand accord from the wife of his best friend, is he would wait till she was asleep, and he'd go out there, and he'd ride around the house and turn on the siren until she came out and yet fussed at him. She was so heartbroken that she actually went missing uh, not long after the funeral, and they couldn't find her. All the police wives were, you know, they had their own little circle, and they were looking for her. They found her in Marvel City Cemetery uh, asleep on his grave. This is uh, Pate going to prison. He's 28 years old. Now, interesting about this picture is the man on the left is Dan Hubbard. Dan was, uh, he was like a chief deputy for the sheriff's office. But just a year later, him, that's him on the left, and that's Frazier Cole on the right. Both deputies were killed. They were standing at a, at a car that they were going to change a tire for, and a taxi cab came and ran them both over and killed them on the Renfro Road. More coverage of uh, the shooting. And interestingly enough, this is the very first Sylacauga Police Department patch that they ever wore. And when they wore that, when they were wearing the baby blue shirts, do you guys remember that? More press coverage. Now, all of this I got from uh, either Miss Higgins, and I, did, I was looking for Miss Higgins to see if she was here, or Terry, I don't see him. But they, were, they, they gave me a lot of this information. These are the flowers, and this is at that place, the Sanford Perriman uh, location. Remember the house? This is the uh, pallbearers lined up outside of the house. Of course, this was in the days when, you know, I guess they took the casket to the house. So all the police officers were there. Another picture of the pallbearers. Uh, this is just three days after... Uh, three or four days after the shooting, the top left is Neil Denny, you know. Now, I don't know how much you know about law enforcement, but Neil Denny is in this picture, and he's standing tough, and he's standing proud. But all these other policemen, they have an opinion about it. Well, I would have done this, or I would have done that, you know. Uh, Neil Denny, in my opinion, didn't deserve that. Um, another picture of the Paul Bears lined up. You'll see uh, one, two, three, four up. You'll see the Alabama patch. That's the old state trooper patch. So you can, so you can tell not just Sylacauga officers came to the funeral. So uh, the FOP worked together to form kind of a coalition to raise some money for Rex's son. Uh, this is a great picture of them. Uh, of course, Leon Archer on the left, Connie Archer's dad. Uh, right, was it Archer, right, Sprayberry? Uh, of course, your mother, uh, your brother, 
Uh, and we have Alan Sanders with the dark glasses, and then to the right is uh, Mr. Brazell. And they're presenting a check uh, to Miss Sanford for the education of Rex Jr., who unfortunately, uh, oh, by the way, Rex Jr.'s best friend was Tom, uh, or Bill Roberts. But Rex passed away at the age of 14, 12, 13? 15. 15. And he's buried next to his father. Here's a great picture of the police department back in those days, and there's Rex, top left. Uh, on the front, on the left, you have, of course, Red Ashcraft, and then here you have Alvin Ryland. Alvin was Red's deputy chief. There's Rex's grave. And he's also on the wall in Washington, D.C. Um, here's a great picture of uh, a flag being presented. Uh, and I think this picture is cool because Beth Yates is in it. Jack White's in it, uh, and of course, Albert Higgins, and Alvin Kidd. There's the picture of the flag being hoisted. That's her son's grave. So interestingly enough, if you go to Marble City Cemetery, and you'll see this gray car here, that's my car, and I'm parked in front of Sanford Perryman's grave. And just it, there's just a straight beeline with an open place to Rex Sanford's grave. It's, it's just, it's interesting. It's a, it's a good place to go and just pay your respects and, you know, appreciate what happened. Picture of your mother. Uh, and she too has family that's associated with the Sylacauga Police Department. And how this happens or what the connection here is, I don't know, but Walt Smith, that's Walt Smith who was a probation officer. His son, Mike Smith, worked for Sylacauga PD and was shot in 1997 and almost killed. There's a picture of Mike. Anybody recognize this little girl? I mean... If you looked at that picture, you would think, you know, that's kind of idyllic. You know, dad, daughter out in the yard playing, probably, I don't know, early, late 50s, early 60s. That's Eileen Warnos. Okay, Eileen Warnos was a, was a female serial killer. Okay, and uh, she was a Sylacauga police chief. And I'm just kidding. I just saw some, I saw some eyes closing. I just threw you a curveball. So Eileen Warnos was a serial killer uh, down in Florida. You know, terrible story, abused as a child, neglected, rejected, all the things that, you know, hate, hated men. Uh, and she had a habit of picking up uh, or letting men pick her up and then, you know, killing them. That's what her hobby was. So... Uh, and she's, I mean, some stunning good looks right there. That looks like my driver's license photo. Uh, there she is in court. There's the movie about her if you want to watch it and you want to see this little Gaga connection in, in real time. Watch this movie, okay? That's uh, Charlize Theron, am I saying that right, Amy? That's the lady that plays her. She's really a pretty actress, but... Anyways, this is a good movie. It's kind of hard to watch, but it's, it's a good movie. So here we are. This is Captain Denny. Uh, and Captain Denny was, was really big in the city on promoting the police department and involving the community in different things. And uh, somebody told me who the little guy right here was, but I can't remember his name. He, worked, he drove the cab. Uh, and this is in front of Walmart, uh, Marble City Plaza. I mean, uh, Ogletree Plaza. And the gentleman on the left was military buddies with Gene Stewart, who died in office. Gene Stewart was the mayor of Sylacauga, and he died while he, while he was serving in that capacity. And he was brought into Sylacauga by Gene Stewart to kind of, you know, re, restructure the police department. Albert Higgins had retired, and they brought in Dick Humphreys. Dick uh, came in, and he really revolutionized the way we do things. He, he created sectors in the city. You know, he did away with, at one time, we had an inside car and an outside car. 
inside car handled everything that was on the inside. The outside car, you know the story. So Dick Humphreys created sectors based off call volumes. I mean, 19, early 1980s revolutionary stuff, you know, actually uh, putting cops where there's crime instead of just random patrolling. He was really ahead of his time. Uh, there's a little uh, close-up picture of him. Uh, and I found, actually, a really good picture of him earlier today when we were having lunch. I was looking through some little photos and found the picture. He's the one that brought this patch in, too. The, it was like a generic security guard patch. But every police department used it. And back then, it was, it was the patch to have. So May 1990, you know, it's, it's odd that, uh, you know, just like Rex Sanford's murder, you know, stories are stories. People, people say and do and tell, but we do know that he did pick her up. We do know that they uh, apparently went to a secluded area in the woods. Um, and we do know that he was shot and killed with his weapon. Um, and they found his badge. So he was the Sylacauga police chief. Uh, then he was murdered by a serial killer. I did not know that was part of the job when I took it. I'm kidding. There's a picture of my dad when he, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so this is the funny part. This is when I tell you the great potato robbery of Sylacauga, Alabama. So Mr. A.J. Powers, how many of you remember Mr. A.J. Powers? He was the little man with the handlebar mustache and the 10-gallon hat that walked up and down the rail tracks wearing the overalls. Uh, he, was, he was an eccentric person, but he was, a, he was a wealth of knowledge. He lived in a cabin that he built off the wood from his land, lived out across from Lake Howard, and he took a special interest to in me because I was always asking questions about history. So I'm out at his place one day. We're sitting in, in front of the fireplace in these two rocking chairs that he made, uh, it's August. There's a roaring fire going. And uh, I said, tell me some stories. This was when I got ready to do the very first presentation of the history of the police department. And he said, well, you ever heard the story about the Adair brothers robbing the bank with potatoes? I said, nope. Lay it on me. He goes and he finds, now, you've seen hoarders on TV. Well, they, this, he's, he's a hoarder, but it's all newspapers. He gets up, this little bitty man, he goes back to this pile and he finds this row and it's not organized and he pulls this paper out and it's the paper. It's the Sylacauga Advance. It's during the Depression, um, probably 33, maybe 32, I can't remember exactly. He would not let me have it and he would not let me take it to photocopy it. But I did read the article. And what happened, the Adair brothers, they lived down at Grimes Chapel Depression, people are hungry, people are, you know, trying to find work. Uh, and so what they did was they said, we're going to rob the bank. Well, you know, this is about the time that John Dillinger had escaped from that Oklahoma jail with a bar of soap. Do you remember that? So you can see it in the movie Public Enemies. He took a bar of soap, carved it, looked like a pistol, and he escaped from prison. So light bulbs came on. So they took some potatoes, they carved the potatoes look like pistols, they used iodine to, to stain them and to make them look authentic. And they went to town and they robbed the bank that is right across from the library. Now, the, you know what the building I'm talking about? It's here, right? Right. So they go in and uh, robbed everybody at Potato Point <laughs> and took off with the money. And they went down to Grimes Chapel and started drinking and looking at their loot. And then the sheriff of the county at that time, uh, and this is the cool part, because the article actually says the sheriff organized a posse <laughs> to go down and apprehend the bank robbers. And, uh, the, and later in the article, they call them bandits. So when I was police chief here, I used to slip words like that into press releases. I would say the bandits were apprehended, you know, nobody ever got it. But, but funny story. So that's a little bit about the history of... Where's she at? She, there you are. Uh, another relative. This is Officer Hobbs. This is uh, Gorsuch first in Broadway, right in traffic. Uh, 
FBI National Academy, so we're fortunate in this uh, city to have multiple members. The first one was Red Ashcraft, uh, and he went, oh, that's, I want to show you this. That's an original signature of J. Edgar Hoover, and I actually have this diploma. So I'm thinking about going to Pawn, uh, Pawn Stars. Is it Pawn Stars? Or uh, Pawn, that's it, right? The Las Vegas? So next one was uh, Ken Solly. Then Lewis went in 91. I went after Lewis. No, I went after Andy. This is Andy Davis. He was the captain here for a long time. He's gone. I went in 2003, and Freeman went in 2006, and then Kelly went his first year as chief. So pretty cool. Something else that is uh, special to Silicaga and the law enforcement community. So these, uh, this is a picture of the one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five law enforcement coordinators in the history of Alabama. Uh, the very first one is Bill Taylor. He's right here. Um, he was appointed to this position by Jeff Sessions uh, in the early 80s. Uh, and this is a very special position to be in because you're kind of the right hand of the attorney general. And both Lewis and myself were both appointed to this position. So two Silicaga chiefs, the only time that's ever happened in history to, to get that post. There's Keith Wilson. There's uh, my baby boy, Butchie Boy, and his wife, Susan. Artie Batson. That's Paul Drake. You guys remember Paul Drake? He was a canine officer here, died of a heart attack while he was working here. Uh, this is cool. Let me show you this. Oh, there's the ID card for Hobbs. Oh, I was going to show you something. Oh, uh, look at Bree's car. There's a particular uh, picture I was looking for. I thought it was closer. Anyways, um, questions? Any questions? No? Did you ever run into uh, uh, Bill Neighbors? The, the Jim. Uh, Jim's dad? Yeah, I, I guess. He's so, so yeah. Jim yeah, so Jim Neighbors, his father was Fred Neighbors, and he was a sergeant at the police department. Matter of fact, he was the first person to show up on the crime scene when the night of Rex's murder, because he lived just across the street. And uh, nobody called him. He heard the gunshots. Jimmy Neal. And now, see, this is where Sherwin-Williams is uh, now. It's, um, it's still there, right? So you see this gutter and all that and the awning? It's still, it's still, this is where they took that picture. That is the ultimate Sulacaga PD picture. I love that. <laughs> so there's Red Ashcraft. And I used to know all of them, but Alvin Rylance up front. And Alan Sanders is uh, third from the right. Marty. Cam Brasher, Steve Vickers, uh, J Sergeant Jimmy Parker. He was in a terrible wreck on 21 North in 1989. He was hit head on uh, by a Hartsfield man, and uh, he was nearly killed, but he continued serving. Uh, Eddie Collier, uh, that's, what's, his, what's that captain's name? Oh, you used to wrench his finger? No. No. No, that's, that's not. Hosey, Arthur Hosey. Sorry about that, Arthur Hosey. He had this weird habit of wrenching his hands like a, you know, like a deviant coming up with a, you know, plan. Another picture of Marty. Some more, just, oh, uh, there's Willie Kidd. You guys remember Big Willie? He was the very first person to retire uh, when I became chief. This is one of my favorite pictures of Neil Denny and the man in the back of the room and uh, the governor at the time.
just random pictures, this and that. Mike Gorman, Mike Gorman served this city for a long time. He's still around. Mike Smith, this is him getting the Purple Heart um, the May after he was nearly murdered in February. If you have a question, shout it out. I'm just flipping through these pictures. Yeah. Um, so I joined the police department in 1994, and I stayed until uh, 2015. I became police chief in 2011. Miss Hodges. Yeah, Sanders. 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 Yeah. Yeah, he rode a, uh, no, uh, there were two three-wheel motorcycles back in those days, and he, he rode it primarily, ruined his back riding it. Um, and then um, Kenneth Brasher and Mike McLaughlin rode motorcycles in the late 70s, all the way through, I don't, 1980, whatever, but the city, uh, McLaughlin was renting her a house from my dad, where my dad lives now. He went home for lunch, and the motorcycle caught the carport on fire. I, I, I do now, and I got to hear this story. <laughs> hmm. And he stuck his hand in there. And my dad put me down there. He was working for Charles Bakery, and I was riding the red truck. Well, you guys, you drove the police car. And we were just down there riding the red truck. Same. And he was like, Well, you know, I'm going to take you It's hilarious. I never, I never heard that, but that will be added to the repertoire. I, I can assure you. Here's Neil Denny. Uh, I, I titled this picture "Standing Down the Klan." This is uh, about 1984. The KKK came to Sylacauga and had a rally where they just stood out in front of stores, but they were not allowed to lower their hoods. And so the police responded by putting a policeman in front of every, every Klansman. There's Willie. This is the first uh, Citizens Police Academy. That's Larry McConifer. There's Neil Denny. Uh, random this and that. Oh, there's a good picture. So Diane Cleveland uh, and Glenn Stevens from the Housing Authority. Remember Glenn? He really revolutionized things for the Housing Authority. And Linda Skinner, so you know Donna, uh, Donna Landers, married to uh, Donnie Landers, the police sergeant. This is her mother, Glenda. She ran the records department for the police department for, for 499 years. <laughs> There's, uh, help me out, Dad. Deborah uh, on the right and Barbara Robinson on the left, dispatchers. There's an old FOP dinner photo. Yeah, I have no idea. There's an old police department uniform pic. Dog catcher. Okay, so um, if we don't have any questions, I guess we can wrap up. But before we go, I do want to uh, thank my family for being here and supporting me. Uh, and for giving me gas money to get up here. And so Amy and I live down in Gulf Shores. I, when I retired in 2018, uh, we moved there. I really left Sylacauga in 2015, so it's been a long time since I've, I've seen you and you've seen me, but I appreciate you uh, giving me this opportunity to come back and share with you, and I, I hope it was entertaining, and I hope 
uh, you learned something today. Uh, thank you to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Squared Steers for the invitation and for, uh, you know, and for all the people that came here just to say hello to. Uh, and I also want to recognize uh, some, someone I'm really proud of, but a newly appointed district judge for Tallahassee County, Dale Price in the back. Dale, judge. So uh, it's, not, it's not that often that Sylacauga gets a win like that. So that's, that's something to be proud of. So, uh, and um, keeping up with you on, uh, on social media and watch your council meetings on YouTube. So, uh, if y'all keep changing council presidents, you're going to be viral before you know it. So, <laughs> word to the wise. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Chris. I think Chris is a prime example of why we have so much history that we need to be saving. And so if you have anything you can add to his presentation or something you want to drop by the library sometime, something you think is unique, let us know. We'll be glad to get that to Chris. Thank you all so much for coming today. You know, next week we wrap up our Brown Bag Series on Wednesday with Dolores Hydock. If you've been, you know she's fantastic. You don't want to miss. She's going to have a hard time following Chris, though. So I want to thank Chris again. And Amy, thank you for coming. Chris is fantastic. Family, and to all the special guests that came that had somebody in the presentation. Thank you all so much as well. Have a good one.